I want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to this year's Commission on Cancer uh, annual lecture. Um, my name is Dan McKellar. I'm the current chair of the Commission on Cancer. A um, couple things before we get started. I just want to recognize uh, a couple distinguished guests, um, Dr. David Winchester, medical director of the cancer programs at the college, um, Dr. Rick Green, um, previous chair of the Commission on Cancer, and then Dr. Lamar McGinnis, um, who is a previous president of the College of Surgeons. Um, and I've just learned some, some history about this lecture. This lecture actually was Dr. McGinnis's idea, and it started in 1988. The first COC lecture was Dr. Judith Volkman in 1988. So thank you for such a tremendous idea, uh, Dr. McGinnis. This really has been a very successful um, uh, part of, of the fall meetings. Um, and, and very important to the Commission on Cancer. Um, I want to take the opportunity to uh, introduce this year's speaker, who um, is a very, very important contributor to the Commission on Cancer in many different ways. Uh, Dr. Uh, Compton has uh, been the most recent representative of AGCC on the Commission, but she's helped us in many other ways on work groups and, um, and helping uh, with developing standards. Dr. Compton is a academic pathologist um, specializing in GI disease and is board certified in both anatomic and clinical pathology. She's a professor at Arizona State University, adjunct professor of pathology at both the University of Arizona and John Hopkins, and a research associate in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. She's chief medical officer of the National Biomarkers Development Alliance, a member of the Biodesign Institute, and Chief Medical Officer of the Complex Adaptive Systems Institute. She's a former professor of pathology at Harvard, um, Chief of Gastrointestinal Pathology at Massachusetts General Hospital, and Pathologist-in-Chief um, of the Boston Shriners Children's Hospital. More recently, she has served as the CEO and President of the Critical Path Institute, uh, the Director of Biorepositories and Biospecimen Research, and the Innovative Molecular Director of Biorepositories and Biospecimens at the National Cancer Institute. Um, she also um, is the Stracona Professor and Chair of the Department of Pathology uh, at McGill University in the past, and Pathologist-in-Chief uh, at McGill University from 2000 to 2005. She's a past chair of the Cancer Committee of the American College of uh, the College of American Pathologists, immediate past chair of the American Joint Committee on Cancer (AJCC), and currently she is the chair of the Precision Medicine Corps of the AJCC. Her research interests focus on colorectal cancer, uh, medical uh, prediction, biomarker development, and she has authored more than 500 scientific manuscripts, review articles, books, and chapters. We are very, very honored to have Dr. Compton speak. Thank you, Carolyn, for being here. Thank you, Dan. Um, and I am truly honored to be here, and more especially because my mentor um, from Harvard, uh, Dr. Folkman, was the first lecturer. I have big shoes to fill. And I am a pathologist, and uh, this is the American College of Surgeons, and you invited me anyway. So I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm picking up on the theme of this conference, um, the, the future of surgery, the surgeon of the future. And I'm going to be talking about how technology is changing the way we practice medicine and even the way we conceive of disease, how it, uh, how it occurs, how it progresses, and the strategies that we must use to treat it. They are all changing, and it is technology that is responsible for most of these changes. Um, we are looking at a landscape now in which we have a panoply of new tools, powerful new tools that have created new knowledge and a new era in medicine. And in fact, this is the front page of Nature uh, that was reporting the results of the Human Genome Project, um, which 
prophesied then, uh, this is 14 years ago, that the convergence of advanced technologies, molecular biology, and data science would change the way we practiced medicine. And the, we are, in fact, in the midst of this change of a defining moment in medical history, an unprecedented potential for exponential progress in oncology. But it's a very challenging time. It's a little scary for everyone. Um, but, but this is the basis for this change. Technology development unleashing the potential for progress. This is Gordon Moore from Intel, who uh, prophesied in 1965, so this is a long time ago, now this is 50 years ago, that he predicted the power of computing technology would double every two years. Now this was referable mostly to the number of transistors that you could squeeze into a dense integrated circuit on a, a microchip, but it in fact became um, the, the mantra of technology development in general, this faster, better, cheaper, exponential increase in the power of technology. And, and, and that has in fact endured to this very moment the exponential increase in technology has led, in turn, to an exponential increase in data, which has, in turn, resulted in an exponential increase in human knowledge. And in fact, today, all human knowledge is thought to be only about 1% of what it will be in 2050. That's all human knowledge in the history of man up till this moment. Knowledge is now doubling every 12 months, and it, it's soon to be a doubling every 12 hours. At least that's the projection that IBM has made uh, that is dependent on the build-out of the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things will connect embedded sensors and computing devices throughout our world. It's already doing this. Smart objects automation, machine-to-machine -machine communications, the connectivity of our universe is, is increasing in ways we never imagined. And this Internet of Things um, can be used and is being used throughout the world for multiple purposes that is changing our universe, not just in medicine, used for energy management, environmental sensing systems, urban planning, transportation systems, management of cities and urban systems, law enforcement, warfare. But it is also rapidly changing medicine and healthcare systems throughout the country. So if we go back to the basis of this transformation, all starting with that nature cover, uh, the Human Genome Project was made possible by the advances in technology and the high throughput, inexpensive molecular analysis that has come to uh, the point where we are today of the holy grail, the thousand dollar genome. This is a disruptive technology, genomic sequencing, that has been the uh, the quintessential example of Moore's Law, with increasing power and speed and decreasing cost, cost decre de decreasing so fast that I actually had to blow up this uh, small window uh, to show you how rapidly the, uh, the costs have dropped for whole genome sequencing. Now, it's, it's, it's also um, been um, somewhat elusive, the $1,000 genome, and for the last four years, everyone has said in many technical journals that um, the $1,000 genome would occur the following year. It seems that we have finally arrived. Um, the uh, uh, Illumina High Seq machine can now sequence 16 genomes per day. This is un 
unthinkable power, um, a power that is available to everyone, of course, who has the $16 million to buy the machine, but this is still an incredible advance for biomedicine. Now, you could sequence a human genome um, in the olden times uh, when I was practicing medicine back in Mass General in 1990. Um, you could sequence the human genome with the technology available at that time, but it would have taken you eight years to get the results, and it would have cost you $3 billion. Um, a decade ago, it would have taken you six months to a year and cost you $100 million. Today, you can get the same results with greater accuracy within less than 24 hours at a little over $1,000. And with the rate of development today, um, in the next year or two, we will be able to get whole genome sequences within eight hours for $100. This will mean that whole genome sequencing will become the complete blood test of tomorrow and that every patient coming into the hospital will have this test, which puts into the hands of the physician powerful data that can change the way that you address the patient, manage the patient, and manage their disease. We are also understanding what all of this genomic data means. We have conducted over the last decade large-scale wide uh, genome-wide association studies linking genetic variation to disease risk. The rate of development of these kinds of linkages has been breakneck speed. In 2005, so this is just 10 years ago, there were very few gene association linkages uh, with disease that we had validated on the human uh, chromosomal map. But as time went by and the um, NHGRI uh, uh, went forward at the National Institutes of Health and the human genome was further probed and the GWAS studies carried out worldwide, we began to see a very rapid growth in this uh, association map. And in fact, it, it became uh, so rapid that uh, I can't even fit all of the diseases onto a single diagram, but this is the one seen on the NHGRI uh, website, um, and it is uh, now ca in this catalog of 14,000 published disease trait associations within this catalog through the end of 2013, so that doesn't even um, add all of the genome associations that have been added uh, since then, during this last year. This is an incredible map of uh, understanding uh, of, of human disease and the human genomic traits that predispose us to different types of diseases and to different responses to treatments. The next great advance that allowed us to take advantage of these technological uh, advances, it was the, that in data science. And without this parallel advance, we would not be able to use uh, any of this data to the advantage of our patient. Data science has made it possible to analyze, integrate, and computer model huge amounts of data representing very complex layers of biology and clinical medicine. And in fact, this is all being brought in real time to individual physicians at their desktop, empowering researchers and clinicians to access and integrate all kinds of data flavors from genes to genomes to transcriptomes to pathways, integrating this with clinical data to create an understanding of disease that we never had before. And this brings us to the age of computational biomedicine. There is so much data, and it is so complex, and it is so challenging um, to bring it together to form new knowledge that we cannot do this uh, with our brains alone. Even the smartest human beings, and I would say that some of them are even members of the American College of Surgeons, um, can, 
can only integrate an average of five different pieces of data simultaneously to make one decision. If you're really smart, perhaps you can integrate seven different pieces of data to come to one decision. But with the data generation power that we have now with 25,000 genes and greater than 2 million proteins and 10 to the 7 SNPs in the HapMap database, there is no way that a human brain can integrate and use this information without information technology, artificial intelligence aiding us. In fact, precision medicine as we envision it, based on all this molecular knowledge, um, is going to be, and in fact is now, completely dependent on artificial intelligence systems. Just to put this into perspective, I'm going to show you one example of, of big data. Uh, the, actually, the poster child for big data, which is the human genome. The human genome is 3.2 billion base pairs. And in sequencing a human genome, um, we create uh, a more than 400 gigabases per sample of just raw data, which that then has to be assembled and mapped. Variants have to be called and, and analyzed uh, against databases that we have uh, accumulated, and functional annotation has to be added to that, all adding pieces of data to the process um, as it moves along. So if you take the average whole genome analysis Analysis with 60x coverage, which is about average, you generate a thousand gigabytes of data per sample. And when you're talking about cancer, each biopsy, even from the same tumor mass, may have a different genome, and certainly the genome of the primary tumor may differ from that of each of the metastases. So if you sequence more than one biopsy, just do the math to multiply uh, the 1,000 gigabytes per sample um, into an analysis that we might undertake for a single patient. So what is 1,000 gigabytes of data? How big is big data? I, I would even argue that um, we've taken big data to the next step already. We're, we're now in the age of humongous data. A thousand gigabytes is a terabyte of data. A terabyte of data is about 333,000 MP3 song, sound compression files. It's 200, 235 terabytes will can will encompass the entire contents of the Library of Congress in terms of uh, digital data. Now, if you move to um, a thousand genomes, say, which would be um, more than the number that have been analyzed in the, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, in which I participated at the NCI, um, this is just modestly speaking now. Um, a thousand genomes would give you a million gigabytes of data or one petabyte of data. So, so, so how big is a petabyte? A petabyte, a petabyte is the entire storage capacity of our brain. It's also equal to 63,000 dumb smartphones like the one I own. It's equal to um, enough sound compression files that it would take 2,000 years to play them all. Two petabytes of data uh, would encompass the entire contents of all U.S. research libraries, and 50 petabytes of data could contain the entire written works of humankind from the beginning of time. Now, just to put that in perspective, the Large Hadron Collider produces 100 petabytes of data every single day. So there is no question that we have moved already into the zettabyte era 
Um, and uh, this is something so far beyond our comprehension that um, we actually need to regroup when we're thinking about how to apply this to day-to-day -day medicine. How is this going to happen? We're, we're in an era now where all of the science that we do in biomedicine um, is, is, in fact, um, big science. Um, the cancer, in the cancer world, in fact, um, we are, as a research enterprise, the, the best example of, of team science and enterprise-wide focus on genomic data. Um, it, it's, it's a research era that I call the 4M era, multi-investigator, multi-modality, multi-institutional, and multi-million. So we are going to continue to produce humongous data at breakneck speed um, and with ever-increasing efficiency and power, as I said, exponential growth. And all of this, we must figure out how to bring to the benefit of patients. Because where are the payoffs for patients for all of this data? They are dependent on the evolution of data into knowledge. So you can increase the amount, the volume of data, but until you increase the connectedness of this data to be able to understand relationships between the different data types, to be able to understand patterns of information coming out of this data and be able to turn that into knowledge, we will not have value for patients unless we are able to do this. So this is our next great challenge on the table. And we certainly are facing great challenges. We have created great advantages, but we certainly have great challenges now on the table in turning this all into value. We have big data quality disparities. Everyone can buy a sequencer, but the quality of data coming out of each and every experiment differs greatly. And we have no data standards across the enterprise. We have big knowledge gaps. We certainly haven't turned all of this data into understanding. It's, we certainly haven't connected all of these data flavors, and we certainly haven't turned it into knowledge. And we have big privacy challenges, which we are now addressing, but only if a celebrity has nude photos um, pilfered from the cloud. So we really need to focus on this um, in the medical world um, rapidly in order to take advantage of this power. We, we have need of uh, means of transporting all this data. We need big pipes to do it. We have big storage needs and we have big analytical needs. And there are very few organizations in this country, indeed around the world, who have these capacities. And, and in fact, um, we're all investing big bucks and expecting big payoffs from all of this. We're betting on it. We are, we are certainly um, betting on it in, in the medical world, but, but in other enterprises as well, but so are Google and Amazon. And the reason that they are investing so deeply is that they are the ones with the big pipes, big storage, and big analytics. So it will, these will be the organizations that will control what we do until we step out um, to, to provide leadership um, ourselves. Now, this is a, uh, a quote which um, I heard from Murray Brennan. I, I thought I needed to, uh, to come back to first principles here because Murray is an old friend and colleague, but he's also um, uh, a surgeon of extraordinary renown. And um, he, he um, agrees that data matters. And so I thought this would just bring it back to all the surgeons in the audience, that this is not ethereal serial. This, this matters to um, surgeons and other types of physicians every day in practice. And, and here are, um, are, are some of the 
uh, realities. This is one of the ones that um, Murray was involved with because this was being tested at Memorial Sloan Kettering for application to medicine. It's, it's one approach to analyzing and integrating data. This is IBM's Watson. This is a computer that processes natural language. This machine can instantaneously read all of the medical literature and make associations among the different facts um, to answer medical questions. It's, it wasn't built for medicine, but its utility for medical application is now being tested. This will be one approach um, to aiding us in being able to take advantage of what we already know and have already published. But we are going to need bigger brains if we are going to be able to analyze and integrate in real time, not just processed data, but all raw data that now exists in all of these uh, storage repositories that we have built in the research and clinical world um, internationally and nationally. So enter the world of neuromorphic computing. Um, IBM is now building computers that uh, rival the human brain in terms of pattern recognition, something that, that computers to date have not been good at. The human brain excels at complex tasks like pattern recognition and that uses very low energy in order to do this. And this is not yet ever been replicated artificially. And, and in fact, there's no programming needed in the human brain because all of the pathways that um, are consistently used are reinforced and expanded and all the ones that are not used are paired away automatically, biologically. There are 100 million neurons and 100 trillion synapses in the brain that allow this connectedness um, to produce these, these strengths in pattern recognition. Now, the first steps um, by uh, computing companies to try and replicate this, this, uh, this function was IBM Sequoia. Um, it, it simulated network communications in the human brain, all those neurons and synapses, but it was highly energy inefficient. It required 12 gigawatts to perform at brain speed, and 12, and whereas the human brain performs at tens of watts, 12 gigawatts is the combined power consumption of Los Angeles and New York City. So obviously this wasn't going to meet our needs, um, but but more recently, IBM has developed a computer called True North um, through its, it's known as a neuromorphic computer. It has wired transistors together to form a million digital neurons with 256 million synapses. And it accomplishes complex tasks like pattern recognition at high speed and low energy. So it, it may be not in the, in the distant future that we see computers like this performing or helping us to perform some of the pattern recognition tests like um, reading imaging studies or um, reading um, H&E slides in the pathology laboratory um, that can aid us in patient care. Meanwhile, this is happening. Technology is changing the world of clinical data collection and analysis. These are point-of-care testing devices that are changing the way that we collect um, that that we collect data from our patients. Um, we won't be waiting for them to come to us in the hospital or the clinic. We will be um, receiving this kind of data directly from point of care wherever the patient is. Technology is also expanding the world of real time data streaming um, with wearables that uh, you see now um, almost ubiquitously. Uh, I, I, I don't know um, how many of you have 
rushed out to buy your Apple Watch, but um, certainly uh, companies like Apple are, are deeply investing in wearables in the healthcare arena. They recognize that this is um, an expanding market. And Google has produced um, a smart contact lens which measures glucose levels and continuously streams that data um, to uh, any physician that is taking care of that patient. And, and even broader analyses are able to be performed. And, and if you think that this is science fiction, each one of these devices is in fact in use as I speak by the Department of Defense. These are point of care miniature testing devices, lab on a chip, lab on a tip, lab always on, lab on me. These are small micro devices that are able to perform laboratory tests in real time and continuous reads of that data can be streamed by wireless transmission to the physician. We will no longer be rely, relying on a one point in time interaction with our patients to collect data. We won't even need the patient to be in the same room with us. Technology is changing the world of patient physician interactions, follow up and consultations. What, through devices like medical Skype, mobile devices, telemedicine. It's changing the world of home health care through robotics and telemedicine, um, docbot physicians and remote presence robots. And in fact, r robotics um, is rife in the world of surgery now and is ever expanding, changing the world of hospital health care and expanding the abilities of surgeons and the abilities of other physicians. Automated control, visualization, and dexterity are, are three of the great advantages that robotic surgery confers. Google Glass, aut augmented reality, gives you the ability um, to, to see um, the monitored statistics of your patient in real time as you operate. Robotic tools of all sizes are changing medicine, and in fact, these are some of the micro-robotic devices that are in testing right now, devices for diagnosis, therapy delivery, monitoring, and in fact, can, can nanorobotic surgery be far away? I doubt it, sincerely. Um, these are some of the um, extraordinary devices uh, that are um, in development, in testing, um, and some of them are on docket for FDA approval. And, and it's going nowhere but up. Um, robots are everywhere. This is a world census of robots. Um, this is not even counting micro-robots like the ones I just showed you. Uh, the robot population doubling time is right now 2.5 years. Um, it, it, and just at that rate, um, in, in 2035, there will be more robots than human beings in the world. So, so I, I think that this um, will definitely change um, what, what we do in the hospital, how we address patients, um, and which, which tasks we offload to robots and which tasks we ask robots to help us uh, do more precisely and more efficiently. And there's more technology coming. Biotechnology, synthetic biology, ubiquitous sensing devices, social networks, this is in fact the internet of things on steroids, advanced computing and computer modeling, human machine interactions, the ability to run uh, an artificial prosthetic arm by brain um, waves is, is a reality now. Um, disruptive technologies to come we can't even imagine. This is really going to change the way we see biospace, connected space, cyberspace and simulation space, cognitive space, and in fact, 
when we're looking forward to the future, it's all about opportunity space. This is going to produce new patterns of technology fusion, more than one technology coming together to produce even greater synergistic power, um, evolution, and adoption. This is all supported, all of this, by advanced manufacturing, 3D fabrication, and new assembly technologies. But even those technologies, and I, I didn't even mention those in, in, in any detail, um, are evolving exponentially um, as well. So we will be able to create more sophisticated robots um, in, as a result uh, of these um, manufacturing techniques as well. And I, I just wanted to make sure that I, and this is an oncology lecture, that I mentioned the turning point that has occurred, is occurring, in cancer medicine now as a result of our ability to analyze cancer in new ways as a result of technology. We have acquired new biological insights, and we now see cancer in a completely different way. I am a member of the Complex Adaptive Systems Institute at Arizona State University, and one of the systems uh, that we study is cancer. It is it is the poster child for complex adaptive systems. Cancer genome complexity has been revealed to be extraordinary. There are formidably complex catalog of genomic changes and molecular network disruptions in cancer that we have now discovered through technological advances that allow us to analyze and, and reveal these things. Networks are highly interactive and redundant in ways we never knew before. Plus, cancer is continuously evolving. The continued accumulation of genomic alterations, generating numerous clones and subclones with different genomic alterations and phenotypes, both within a patient within a single lesion, between lesions, and between patients. Um, and then there's the treatment-driven evolution. Every time we touch a cancer with a therapy, it becomes a new beast. It evolves to a, uh, a, a new entity that has the ability to evade our treatment strategies through selection and fitness. So in fact, in the future, we're going to have to devise computational approaches to cancer that helps us treat not only the patient in real time, but treat where the puck is going and understand how that cancer is evolving and will be evolving according to the treatment that we administer and treat that um, puck uh, and cancer in the future um, as, uh, as part of our strategy. This is uh, uh, just a modest map showing the panorama of really extraordinary genomic alterations that we've uncovered in projects like the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. The number of mutations per megabase of tumor DNA, now remember there are 3,000 megabases in, in the human genome, and for some of the more um, uh, heterogeneous cancers, like lung cancer and melanoma, you can average 10 mutations per megabase. That's extraordinary. And in fact, it can vary all the way up to 100 mutations per megabase. And then there are 3,000 megabases. So the number of mutations in some complex cancers is mind-boggling. 
um, in fact, if you look at copy number alterations in solid tumors, the fraction of the genome um, that is involved, that is altered in copy number variation, again, with some of the complex tumors like ovarian and lung cancer, over half of the genome is involved. This is far more extraordinary than we had envisioned. Um, The complexity of the genome, chromosome, and network interactions in cancer is just extravagant. And it, it makes us look at cancer in a different way. I think simplistically, um, when I was in training, we saw cancer as a complicated system not a complex system. A complicated system, um, and we're surrounded by complicated systems, we build them, um, have low degrees of design freedom. That is, the number of variables that have to be specified to completely define the process is limited, is low. Um, The behavior of the components and the assembled system as a whole is absolutely predictable. So when that rocket blew up yesterday that was on its way to the space station, that's a complicated system. But it it is going to be possible to find the cause of that explosion and fix it, just like we did the O-rings, because we're dealing with a complicated, not a complex system, because performance of the system is fixed, and it is not capable of autonomous evolution, unlike cancer, unlike complex systems, which have very high degrees of design freedom. They have unpredictable behavior. The properties of the whole system of the cancer cannot be reliably predicted from knowledge of the properties of the individual isolated subunits, the molecules, the cells. So we can know all about the individual mutations. We can know all about the individual genes and proteins, but we cannot, from that, predict the behavior of the whole system. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. And in fact, cancer like all complex system, has, is defined by emergent properties. New properties emerge from the interaction of simpler units and new and unexpected patterns of interaction between components can shift the system to a new phase state with very different properties. And we observe that every day in the clinic with every cancer patient we treat. Complex systems in a complex world. This is the world we live in. These are complex systems. Internet, social media, hacking, fraud, financial systems, the stock market, economic collapse, transportation and supply chain logistics, anti-terror defenses, political instability, and the emergence of antibiotic resistance. These are all defined by emergent properties that are unpredictable. If they weren't, and you could predict the stock market, um, none of us would need to be working. So complex adaptive systems are, in fact, ubiquitous in nature. They have high degrees of design freedom. Earth systems, we're used to this and when we're trying to predict the weather um, or we're, uh, we're, we're trying to um, uh, define host pathogen interactions or coordinated community behaviors such as in, in insects and birds and uh, migratory behaviors. But, but cancer is really the quintessential example of a complex adaptive system, and yet we have never approached it this way. Um, Its emergent properties with state shifts are outlined here. I don't need to convince you that cancer can and does escape from controls, from normal architectural design, from genomic stability, from um, uh, detection by the immune system, um, it, it can invade and metastasize in unpredictable ways, and it can evade um, the drugs and the drug pathways uh, that, that we create. So given all of this, um, I would suggest that our vision of precision medicine needs to be reevaluated. 
And if we are to be the physicians of the future, we need to have a more realistic view of the wily beast of the foe that we fight. This is a a diagram from the Personalized Medicine Coalition that outlines the theoretical approach that we would take in an era of precision medicine, that we would do molecular analyses to define the molecular makeup, which in turn would tell us what the right drug would be to treat, and instead of trial and error, we would hit a home run and we would achieve a therapeutic success for which we would monitor also using molecular analysis. But this is a laughably simplistic view of what I've just been talking about. And the current concept of targeted therapeutics, one targeted agent for one mutated gene creating one mutated protein, um, given this extraordinary complexity, uh, can never hope to succeed. We're going to need to take a much more uh, concerted view of all of the approaches that we now have at our advantage, and we are taking advantage of them. Surgery, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, and embrace the complexity of, of what we're facing. Uh, I would suggest that this is uh, the future for us. Um, I think for surgeons, um, there's, there's very good news here. And I guess if I had to leave us with, with one thought, um, it would be this, that the complexity of cancer is irrelevant in terms of therapeutic strategy if you can find it early and cut it out. Um, but for the rest, um, it, it's, it's essential that we take advantage of the data that we have, that we take advantage of the technology that allows us to integrate, analyze, and understand that data, connect it to knowledge, turn that knowledge into therapeutic strategies for our patients, and embrace this complexity. And, and this is one of my favorite quotes from w- William Gibson, but um, it, it, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And, and everything that I showed you, everything in this lecture that I showed you, exists right now. And none of it existed when I was a physician in training. This has all happened within the last 30 years. Uh, This is all going to transform what we do as physicians in the next 30 years. And and, and it's happening in real time. This is real, um, and it's a challenge even to understand it, to grapple with it, let alone to embrace it. Um, But the leadership of medicine um, is, is in this room, um, and I have great faith that this will be the turning point for us and for patients um, in the future and that we will bring cancer um, into submission. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Dr. Compton, I really want to thank you for that very fascinating, um, thought-provoking uh, lecture. And I, wa- and I really appreciate you giving of your time to be here. For those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Compton's uh, a, a outgoing member of the COC, so she was here Sunday, and then she was brave enough to stay in a city with thousands of surgeons, probably a scary thought for a pathologist, so that she could be here today to give this lecture. And I really appreciate it. As busy as you are. Uh, that means a lot to us that you were able to do that. I think we have some time for some questions. Um, there's there's a couple mics there. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Compton, thank you very much. 
I think I may be speaking for several in the room as adult learners. Instead of being overwhelmed by your talk, which is what most of us are feeling, <laughs> how can we find your sources that we can go to to, uh, with busy schedules, start to understand the components that you've had with limited time to do it? Mm -hmm. You know, I was asked this question yesterday. Um, the Physician Educational Network uh, was here um, filming some 15-minute uh, interviews with various speakers and, and, and asked me about that. And um, I, um, I said that there, were, there was dynamic tension uh, in the world of medicine right now. And m my... Um, I, my answer to your question, David, is I don't know the answer. Um, but I do know, I, what I do appreciate is, um, is the fact that every day you are, as practicing physicians, so consumed with patient care, so consumed with doing um, the right thing with the knowledge and the tools that you have right now, as well as the e enormous um, task of dealing with reimbursement and dealing with privacy issues and dealing with medical legal issues. and the, it's, the practice of medicine has become overwhelming. And in fact, it's on the, t it's on the clock. Every 12 minutes, you've got to see a new patient. Every, and it's, to me, um, the, the dynamics of medical practice are at odds um, with, uh, with adult learning. You, you barely have time to think during a daily practice of medicine, let alone learn. And this is a very, um, I, 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 I guess, shocking talk when you, if you don't know that all of this is going on, and it is. Um, and to, to, to breathe here, I've seen it because I worked, I'm a, still a recovering Fed, so I, I worked in the federal government and worked a lot with DARPA, worked a lot with the FDA, worked a lot with the Department of Defense, and of course um, with all of the tech, and I ran a technology development program at the NCI. Dan mentioned it when he introduced me. It, it was called the Innovative Molecular Assessment Technologies for Cancer Program. It was high risk, high impact. Um, it uh, didn't need any preliminary data to, to um, uh, if you could convince a special technical panel that your idea would be transformative if it worked, you'd get the money. And in fact, some of the, um, the technologies that I, I mentioned here today that have become household names were first funded by this program in their, in, in their incipient phases. So things like Illumina and Affymetrics and Mud Pit technology, Rain Dance technology, they, they, they came out of this program. So I got to see how this world of physicists, chemists, engineers um, were creating powerful tools. They, they didn't know what they were good for. Um, it's the physicians that, that can put these into practice. But the power of these things is, is, is extraordinary. And, and unless you know about them, you're, you're never going to be able to take advantage of them. So there's this huge information gap between what's possible, what's going on in real time now, what's coming down the pike, and your everyday life. Um, I can only say that um, I think we need a new um, form of education. I, I, I didn't see any presentations at this, uh, in this entire meeting that were dedicated to what's, what's coming in, in quite this way. Um, it, 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 it would be, I think, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to keep our finger on the pulse to make sure that we're not overwhelmed, overcome by, uh, by these advances, but that we feel empowered and excited and take, and are able not only to take the opportunity, but to lead when it comes to their application. Um, this is a, this is a, an opportunity for leadership for not only for surgeons but for the entire medical community and I think it's time that we take it. 
Uh, very thought-provoking presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, currently struggling as part of the North Carolina Medical Board with telemedicine. And um, we have a very difficult um, uh, a framing for the problem because telemedicine with all the technology may or may not be a benefit in primary care since we are replacing known entities with unknown entities as far as diagnostics go. Um, and that same frame of reference of problem sort of extends out beyond into the genomics. We're still struggling with basic problems with public health in order to best benefit humankind. Um, and that struggle seems to be at odds with the very optimistic presentation that we got from you today. It is at odds with it um, because we haven't learned how, first of all, I, I talked about the gaps that are present. This is, uh, this is powerful stuff, but it, if, if used um, inappropriately, if used without validation, if not quality controlled, um, and if not channeled um, to the right applications, um, it won't pass the, uh, to, to quote Judah Folkman, um, the so what test. Um, we, we, we need to make certain that we connect, and, and that's why I made such a point of connectedness. We have to connect all of this uh, new information, new power of technology um, to the problem that we're addressing. You're, you're absolutely right. It's not connected now, and it is at odds. And, and the, the, the medical expenditures and the costs of all of this, although they are dropping, um, are, 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 are at odds with the rising overall medical costs that we're seeing and encountering right now. So I, this is far beyond, um, this is more of the complexity. We, we need, we need, um, strategies to be able to um, connect these things, to be able to do the medical economics that will allow us to 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 phase these things into uh, real life application, um, this um, is not a panacea without uh, some strategies, that, and and we don't have any. I, I and unless you first know about it, it's hard to strategize. So it's one step at a time, learning what is on the horizon, what's possible, what's out there, thinking about how to apply it, knowing what problems um, are in need of these, these kinds of applications, and, and devising a plan, a roadmap um, to, to bring them um, to application. It's, it's only the physicians. That's why I said though I learned from the IMAT program. The technology developers don't always know what their advances can be used for. They're waiting for us to tell them. Um, so there, there's a, I think that there's a need for more integration, not just learning um, from physician to physician, but that we need more multidisciplinary education and more multidisciplinary structure in our planning going forward. Um, it's not just about surgeons. It's not just about pathologists. And in fact, it's not just about physicians in general. It's, there's a whole uh, ecosystem that we're going to have to um, embrace together if we're, if we're going to be successful. Um, that, and that's my, that's an, an opinion of mine, but I don't see how we can do this um, in, in, si in siloed form. Thank you.